Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the director of the Institute of Central Europe, uh, Professor Beata Sulmach, I would like to welcome you all to the webinar 30 Years of Ukraine's Independence, Achievements and Challenges. First of all, I would like to thank our speakers for accepting the invitation to participate in today's event. My name is Anna Bajenova, and I'm delighted uh, to be uh, to chair this session today. This discussion uh, is organized by the Department of Eastern Europe. Before we begin, I would like to read a welcome letter we received from the General Consulate of Ukraine in Lublin. It is written in Polish. Szanowna, szanowna Pani Dyrektor, Konsulat Generalny Ukrainy w Lublinie składa wyrazy szacunku i ma zaszczyt pogratulować z okazji zorganizowania w Instytucie Europy Środkowej kolejnej konferencji na temat Ukrainy i współpracy polsko-ukraińskiej w dniu 15 czerwca 2021 roku. Szczególnie dziękujemy, że obecna konferencja poświęcona jest niezwykle ważnej dacie dla Ukraińców, czyli jest to lat odnowienia niepodległości Ukrainy. Naród polski jest wiernym sojusznikiem i przyjacielem Ukrainy. Od wielu lat popiera jej starania w sprawie wzmocnienia niepodległości i suwerenności oraz rozwoju transformacji demokratycznych i integracji europejskiej. Korzystając z okazji, wyrażamy uznanie dla polskich partnerów za solidarność w niewypowiedzianiu trudnej sytuacji, w której Ukraina realizuje rozwój gospodarczy i państwowy i, w, i tworzy wysokie standardy życia dla obywateli. Przede wszystkim chodzi o wsparcie międzynarodowe w obliczu trwającej agresji na wschodzie Ukrainy, zdradzieckie próby aneksji Krymu, narzuc, naruszanie integralności terytorialnej i suwerenności Ukrainy. Ukraińcy obrońcy od siedmiu lat dzielnie bronią pokoju w, Ukrai w Ukrainie i Europie, oddając swoje życie i zdrowie. Na pierwszym miejscu dla nas jest przywrócenie pokoju na Ukrainie, powstrzymanie agresji wojskowej działaniami polityczno-dyplomatycznymi, osiągnięcie tego, z czym Polska niezmiennie pomaga Ukrainie. W związku z tym życzymy organizatorom i uczestnikom webinarium sukcesu i owocnej dyskusji, satysfakcji w, z komunikacji i budowania dobrych więzi z ukraińskimi naukowcami i politologami. Taka współpraca pomaga ukraińskim władzom kontynuować pracę na rzecz rozkwitu Ukrainy w rodzinie narodów europejskich. Z poważaniem, konsul generalny Ukrainy, Wasyl Orluk. Now, uh, let me introduce uh, our today's speakers. Professor Georgi Kasyanov is the head of the Contemporary History and Politics Department at the Institute of History of Ukraine, National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. He is the author, editor, and co-author of many books about the social, political, and intellectual history of Ukraine of the 19th, 20th, and 23rd centuries, as well as works on politics of history and the theories of nation and nationalism. Professor Kasyanov, along with Professor Minakov, are the editors of the recently published uh, impressive volume, From the Ukraine to Ukraine, a Contemporary History, 1991-2021, which gives a detailed overview of the most important issues facing today's Ukraine. Our next speaker will be Professor Mikhail Minakov, who is a senior advisor at the Kenan Institute, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He works in the areas of political philosophy, political theory and history of modernity in, uh, in the Eastern Europe and in the Western Eurasia. Professor Minakov is the author and co-author of many books in philosophy, political anal uh, an analysis and policy studies. As an editor-in-chief, uh, he, he runs the Ideology and Politics Journal, the Canon Institute's blog Focus Ukraine and the Coney Community Platform. And our last speaker will be Dr. Raman Petur. He's the associate professor at the Department of International Organizations and Diplomatic Service at the Institute of International Relations, Tarashevchenko National University of Kyiv. 
Dr. Petur write, writes very, very extensively, uh, in, extensively on the theory of international relations, foreign policy of Ukraine, international relations in the Middle East, as well as um, about relations of Ukraine with the Near East and the Middle East. Before I give uh, the floor to our distinguished speakers, I would like to uh, let the audience know that uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them uh, in uh, by submitting them in Q and A um, function. You can find this function at the bottom of your screen. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is I am very delighted to give the floor to our first speaker, Professor Georgi Kasyanov who will be talking about the nationalization of Ukraine during the 30 years of its independence. The floor is yours. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as far as I understand, I have about 20 minutes. Uh, so, um, uh, what I uh, what will uh, my what my uh, report will be about is a kind of uh, uh, process of uh, which called nationalization of uh, of uh, citizenry, and um, uh, the basis for my uh, further speculations will be uh, the uh, some theoretical preconceptions of sorry, some theoretical. Um, uh, formulations of uh, Stefan and Linz and uh, Rogers Brubakers. Uh, it is interesting that about um, 20 years ago there was discussion in Ukrainian uh, academic world uh, and uh, around uh, about uh, applicability of the uh, Brubakers theory to Ukraine. And there was a kind of, well, kind of heavy critics criticism about uh, about this, that uh, people just say that no, it's not nationalizing state. It is a Ukraine is an exception, and that uh, then uh, that so we do not have national conflicts. Uh, everything goes smooth, and uh, everything which Bruce Baker's formulated about uh, Ukraine. He mentioned Ukraine in in his uh, famous book and article. Uh, so. Nothing is applicable. Ukraine has a kind of uh, different path in its, in its development. However, in 11 years, uh, 10 years later, after this discussion, there was another article written by Bubecker, uh, and it was uh, it happened exactly. This was published exactly after uh, Yushchenko uh, came out of the power and Yanukovych came to power. And then now it is. Once again, it's very interesting. Now, again, in almost 25 years after a publication of Brubaker's article and book, we still go back to the to the discussions about nationalizing state. So uh, this is still actual. The it, this is still on the table, and it's still agenda. The nationalizing state, and then I. Uh, go to connection between this idea of nationalizing state and the idea formulated by Stepan and Linz uh, in the middle of uh, 2000s uh, about state nation and nation state. Generally, I see that this uh, uh, juxtaposition is a kind of uh, um, uh, repetition of uh, old dichotomy between civic nationalism and, and cultural nationalism, political nationalism, and uh, so-called organic nationalism. But generally, it, it was repeated and reformulated exactly in the context of post-communist transformation of uh, Central Eastern Europe. And Ukraine uh, exactly follows the scenario of Central Eastern Europe. But it is interesting, in certain cases and in certain instances, it looks like Ukraine follows examples of Central Eastern Europe of 20s and 30s. And the major idea of Bruce Baker's was about Central Eastern Europe in the 90s, was exactly that they repeat the path of 20s and 30s. Moreover, in some respects, Ukraine repeats the path of 19th century. Some scenarios, some uh, attitudes, some formulations and perceptions came exactly from 19th century. 
which is exactly not about criticism of Ukraine. It is not about uh, putting Ukraine and, and the kind of awkward position that it's, well, some kind of, uh, the, uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, non-historical nation. No, it is about a uh, new uh, attempt to understand the, poli the politics of nation and state building. I have my major thesis is that the idea of the nation state was prevalent over the idea of the state nation, despite the fact that the idea of state nation was presented and still presented. If you look through the, uh, to the constitution of Ukraine and you look at the formulation, the idea of state nation uh, still presented there. We have a concept of political nation. However, the concept of political nation within Ukraine challenged with the concept of ethnic cultural nation. And particularly after 2014, under ex external threat, uh, after annexation of Crimea, after this, uh, uh, well, the uh, hybrid war was commenced by Russia. So after that, the ethnic nationalism once again uh, arose again in more actively and more aggressively. And this once again posed the question about state nation and nation state. So I will give you just two, uh, two uh, cases. Uh, I will discuss two cases, uh, which are, I would say, uh, reflect most profoundly, most visibly the, uh, this uh, interaction between state, nation, nation state, and nationalizing state. It, uh, th these two questions, these two cases are language and the past history, representations of the past. So over 30 years history of Ukraine, of independent Ukraine, the language question was, uh, was a part of agenda of uh, a state and nation building. And uh, at the core of this question, for instance, was the um, topic of the language of instruction, the language of education. It, uh, it should be safe to say that by the end of 90s, beginning of the 1000s, Ukraine just passed this, uh, this uh, um, well, just uh, achieved the the uh, the goal of uh, trans transforming the system of education, and uh, by the beginning of uh, two thousand nine, uh, the percentage of those who were instructed in Ukrainian was larger than the percentage of Ukrainians in the composition of population, of ethnic composition of population. So by now, by 2020, 92% of pupils in Ukrainian schools learn in Ukrainian. Only 8% learn in other languages, mostly uh, among this 8%, mostly Russian. So uh, we have now about 150 Russian schools among 15,000 schools in Ukraine. So we could say that in this field, the task has been completed. However, what we see, uh, well, the nationalizing state proved its efficiency. Moreover, I would say that this part of the project did not provoke uh, real discussions and real uh, controversies in society, when you look through uh, sociological polls, majority of people, including Russians, uh, admit that the education should be conducted in Ukraine, that the major part of education. However, the language questions intensively and aggressively exploited by different political forces at different times. So every, every elections, every presidential parliamentary elections, the language questions question is uh, just well, part of the parcel of all sides. Uh, moreover, I would say that uh, the language question uh, instrumentalized uh, in 2014 played the role in annexation of Crimea and in the launching the uh, conflict at, at Donbas, and which was then transformed into the full-fledged war. So the second part, the politics of the past, the politics of memory. Once again, the nationalizing project presented the history of Ukraine as the history of almost exclusively ethnic Ukrainians. 
other ethnic groups presented in the history of Ukraine for thousands of years uh, were just either neglected or presented as the other from capital O, and this other were not included into the national narrative as self. So that was the problem. And I would say that this problem still persists. We had uh, in the recent years after 2015, we, had, uh, we have observed the process of so-called uh, decommunization. Decommunization was also uh, followed by the most intensive nationalization. It is really interesting that by, the, by this time, by 2014, the national narrative, the standard classical ethnically exclusive uh, ethnic uh, historical and memory narrative was presented everywhere. It was uh, legitimized by the uh, state policies. So it just dominated the school history, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there was no, in fact, there was no need in any more intensive efforts to reestablish this narrative. So what happened? The nationalist part of the national narrative, which is um, uh, directly connected to the uh, activities of uh, and the history of organization of Ukrainian nationalists and Ukrainian insurgent army and other likewise organizations. So this part of the national narrative, the radical part, became a kind of uh, mainstream in the politics of memory in the Ukrainian state. So, and in this case, this provoked again uh, new conflicts. And then these conflicts also coincided with this idea of presenting the Ukrainian history as a history of exclusively ethnic Ukrainians. I would say that uh, this uh, paradigm, uh, the, the history of Ukraine as a history of ethnic Ukrainians, was questioned by Ukrainians themselves. There, was, there were a lot of projects which just uh, meant to introduce the elements of ethnic tolerance, uh, the uh, combating of xenophobia and teaching Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, along with these processes, the process of active promotion and aggressive promotion of nationalist narrative just brought another, uh, uh, another new fresh conflict into the uh, civic life of Ukraine. And that now we have, it's, it's really looks problematic, particularly in terms of the attitudes towards national narrative, nationalist narrative, uh, because if you would observe the sociological polls of different sociological organizations, different firms, uh, for the last six years, you will see first that the communization process is not very much welcomed by the majority of Ukrainian citizenry. And the second, that uh, the promotion of the nationalist narrative, the promotion by the state, because it was a state politics, also not much welcomed, first of all, at certain regions in the south and in the east. So the problem persists and we should to do something with this. And this is also a result also of the activities of so-called nationalizing state. And uh, so at this point, I think that I have, uh, that my time is close to expiring. So uh, I would, I would uh, do some uh, general observations. So Ukraine still, I believe that Ukraine still presents almost classical example of nationalizing state. And uh, we still have a persistence of the nation state model rather than the state nation model. So, and this uh, probably posts the, uh, one of the major challenges of internal challenges in Ukraine, which are heavily manipulated by external actors. So uh, for the sake of uh, doing something with this, we first should, well, this is a political science conference, so I have to, to promote some recommendations. First of all, we have to deal something uh, somehow with this problem of, uh, of the persistence of nationalizing state and the persistence of the nation state over the state nation. Uh, so at this point, I would, I would stop. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready for uh, further discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Georgi, for a very fantastic, uh, as usual, an extremely, extremely interesting presentation. Uh, it is my great pleasure to give the floor to the, our next speaker.
Professor Mikhail Minakov. He will make uh, the presentation on the 30 years of democratization attempts in Ukraine with a very colorful presentation, as we will already see. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much, dear Anna, dear colleagues. Indeed, I would like to look at uh, the attempts of democratization in Ukraine in the recent 30 years. And in a way, it tells the same story, but with a different view uh, that um, uh, Professor Kasyanov just have presented. In my presentation, I will uh, basically talk about three major processes. First of all, that democratization, uh, the third way of de democratization globally, coincides with the history, with the foundation and existence of Ukraine's independence. So now that we live in the period when the third wave is finished and there's a third wave of autocratization, we uh, also get more and more risks for Ukraine's independence. Second idea is that democracy was not yet practiced by citizens of Ukraine. However, on several cases in several periods of our recent history, uh, democracy was the aim and democratization attempts continue to take place. And the third idea is that Ukraine's uh, political development was much more diverse than that only the democratization. We have also this uh, process that Professor Kasyanov just described, for example, nationalization of state, or there's a very important process called uh, the neo-patrimonial politics, systemic corruption, mafia state, dominance of uh, informal groups of uh, the government, something that is also known by the current uh, Polish citizens. There's also, uh, there were also attempts and periods of competitive autocracy. And in, in general, we still have to deal with uh, what can be called hybrid state or the, the state in which different traits, democratization, neopatrimonialism, uh, nationalism, uh, autocratization come together and compete with each other. And this is why Ukrainian history is so rich, so diverse, and so vibrant. So basically, when we look uh, at this graph, you can see how the uh, third wave of democratization reaches the uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, basically former Soviet Union. And Ukraine, uh, which is here, the, the red line, shows us how in terms of liberal democracy, it was prospering in these recent uh, years. But by the change of these waves, you can also understand that there was some processes, some periods, which I would say uh, th there are six periods. The first three are connected development of Ukraine within the framework of post-Stalinist Soviet authoritarian period. This connected with 70s, early 80s, when uh, Soviet Ukraine was about, was one of the most modernized educationally, scientifically, technologically, industrially, but very limited in terms of uh, political rights and civic freedoms. And then there's a second period when freedom returns and the value of democracy returns to Ukraine, which is connected with Perestroika. If you read uh, papers and uh, that reflect debates in Kyiv and uh, in um, other Ukrainian cities, you would see that basically the first signals of perestroika come into Ukraine in 88, but serious multidimensional, plural ideological debate starts only in the fall of uh, 89. And only then uh, Kyiv becomes this vibrant uh, space of competitive ideologies. And in 1990, uh, it goes around to other Ukrainian uh, regions, be it Crimea, be it Donbass or Halicia. Uh, and then 1991 is the uh, period when the new, the third period starts, the foundation uh, of uh, Ukraine as national, democratic, and uh, free uh, state. 
it's basically a period when uh, Ukraine, together with other post-Soviet states, goes through the period when public and private spheres are being uh, uh, divided and separated, whereas there's ideological pluralism returning and becoming part of the practice. In, in terms of uh, competition during elections, in terms of competition uh, of, uh, of uh, different programs, uh, which very soon brings uh, post-Soviet Ukraine to very deep political crisis in 1993. And at that moment, the history of Ukraine in Maidan starts. Although in Kiev, Kiev-centric uh, model that is very popular today, nobody talks about 93, everyone starts with uh, the so-called Maidan on the Hranit, a very small and rather non-influential event in our history. 1993 was a huge protest movement in uh, the regions of Ukraine, which forced political elites finally to agree on early presidential and uh, parliamentary elections, which brought into power the founders of uh, contemporary Ukrainian political system, Kuchma, Leonid Kuchma, and his team. And then the next three periods, it's uh, the, the first cycle, the so-called cycle from uh, 1997 to, to uh, 2004, when we went through democratic decline and establishment of hybrid oligarchic system. And basically, this first cycle from 1993 to 2004, 11 years, when we went uh, from the promise of freedom, the, fro the promise of social state, the promise of free economy, to non-free economy and uh, autocratic attempt. But then the Orange Revolution and uh, everything that was connected with this Europeanization, democratization, and attempt to fight with um, corruption in 2005 have started a new cycle. Again, the promise of freedom, again, uh, attempts to reconstruct uh, socioeconomic and political system that slowly stagnates. There's a democratic period of de democratic decline in late Yushchenko presidency, and mainly it is connected with the presidency of Viktor Yanukovych. And again, we, we are in 2013-14, where the cycle has finished, and the, the, the new attempt of democratization was in place, which was interrupted very fast. And we will see it in the following graphs. So when we look at democratization, the process of establishing democracy, uh, we usually talk about three uh, areas, three components. First component is participatory democracy how citizens participate in decision-making. Second, liberal uh, democracy. What are the rights, civil rights, human rights, and rights of minorities uh, versus uh, rights of uh, government and the majority? And the third one is electoral democracy. How, uh, uh, how vibrant, competitive, and productive are the uh, elections? So if we look at the participatory democracy index, we see that the, the democratization, this blue line represents the average for the post-Soviet uh, countries, and the red line is the, the curve of Ukraine's participatory democracy index. Uh, all the data are based on the uh, data collect, uh, the, the most recent uh, collection of data from the varieties of democracy. So here we, we see the first wave of democratization which takes place uh, around with the perestroika period, Perepudova in Ukrainian, and then the period of relatively high participation of citizens in decision making. And around 1997, the steep decline up until the Orange Revolution. In 2005, there's a rebirth. Ukraine is among leaders uh, in uh, post Soviet uh, region in terms of participatory index. And then around 2009, there's a decline. And up until uh, today, we are not among the leaders. However, in 2018, well, in 2014, there was an attempt of improvement, which was stopped by the war and war-related 
cultural, uh, ideological processes, decommunization, which was already mentioned. So the participatory democracy index was in decline up until uh, 2019. And still we did not reach the leadership positions in this uh, area. The second area, liberal, liberal democracy, the, the rights uh, component, which we never uh, actually practiced in the way that Ukraine could become the leader. But still we were uh, on relatively good terms in this uh, context. Again, in the first period of democratization then the post orange revolution period. And again, under uh, President Zelensky, there was some improvement, but still we didn't reach the leadership positions again. And electoral democracy here, uh, the, the electoral democracy is a trademark of Ukraine. Up until today, we remain uh, among the countries that practice mostly free and fair elections, competitive with unpredictable results. So again, these cycles as about which I was talking, they are also representative here and more or less uh, the, the situation has improved after 2019. However, in 2021, uh, these partial uh, uh, parliamentary elections have, showed, have shown that uh, the old uh, an anti-democratic abuse, uh, abuse of elections are back in power. The, the elections in one of the districts in Western Ukraine have showed that administrative resources back in power, that uh, competition is done uh, in a very, uh, very uncivilized and illegal manner. However, it's still the, the competitive process and uh, the results were almost unpredictable. And there's, uh, th there are several challenges. I will finish with the, the number of challenges that Ukraine uh, faces and it's connected with uh, exclusion by political group. We, we were uh, basically among the most inclusive politically countries up until recently. But when the war started, this exclusion um, was one of the issues. And if you have political exclusion, then the uh, democratization is under risk very much. The second challenge is non-stoppable non corruption. One of the uh, one of the ways ways to measure this corruption is connected with the role that is played by uh, by politically connected companies in the economy. This slide, which comes from the uh, recent research of the World Bank in Ukraine, shows that in spite of uh, Euromaidan, in spite of uh, uh, war the role of politically connected uh, companies was slowly growing. This uh, gray uh, indicator, the number of assets uh, controlled by companies associated with presidents, prime ministers and ministers is growing. And recently, in spite of uh, economic uh, decline or in spite of hardships that Ukraine goes through, the, the role of these companies now it has grown up until 28, almost 29% of assets belong to the, this, uh, uh, these company, companies in 2016. But after that, the measurement stopped. So we still don't know what is uh, the, the role uh, right now. And then we come to another important issue uh, in history of Ukraine, as well as Georgia and Moldova. Uh, unlike Russia, uh, unlike Poland, we, we have a constant problem uh, with freedom and income. In those uh, countries uh, like Belarus or Russia or Azerbaijan, where authoritarian trade was cho chosen very early, there the, the absence of freedom was uh, sub subsidized by uh, income to the households. And in Ukrainian case, and also in other post-Soviet nations, they strive for democratization. Uh, this level of income is much lower. So instead of, we, we have freedoms, we have more freedoms, 
relatively, but we have less income for our uh, households. And it's contemporary uh, situation from this uh, GDP per capita logged according uh, logged on uh, prices for 2010. You can see basically that Ukraine remains underdeveloped in socioeconomic uh, terms in income per capita or per household. So uh, finishing my uh, today's report, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, the, the most recent challenges is of, uh, for, for democratization are also war because it legitimizes many non-democratic forces and ideologies and policies. Another very important issue is secessionism and irredentism, which still um, is quite strong in Ukraine. Part, uh, right now, we don't control part of our territories because of uh, these secessionist irredentist movements supported by Russia and uh, subsidized by Russia. Uh, and this annexation of Crimea and uh, existence of de facto states on internationally recognized territory of Ukraine damages uh, sovereignty of Ukraine. So we constantly are uh, acting in the situation of the deficit of sovereignty, which also undermines the long-term and even mid-term uh, democratization perspectives. And of course, in uh, the situation of war, there's uh, attempts of securitization of politics. But uh, again, uh, we saw ups and downs in terms of democratization in Ukraine. History is not finished. And I hope we will be able to cope with these challenges. And I'm ready to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very bright presentation and insightful one. And uh, I, will, I would like to give the floor to our third speaker. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Raman Pitsur, who will be talking about the evolution of Ukraine's uh, foreign policy discourse during the last 30 years of um, Ukraine history. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be one of the speakers among those respected and distinguished scholars. And it is a great uh, pleasure to talk about the 30 years of Ukraine's independence. Maybe we today will make some preliminary conclusions and give some recommendations. Uh, I will concentrate my uh, speech on the foreign policy issues. And uh, I would uh, start from the proposition that foreign policy of any state is, is a marker of uh, statehood. Uh, generally speaking, if we need to assess whether a state is independent or not, we analyze its foreign policy. Uh, if the state enjoys a high level of independence and sovereignty, uh, then its foreign policy decisions uh, would be the decisions of its own and not of its neighbors or partners elsewhere. Uh, today we gathered to discuss the 30 years of independence of Ukraine and uh, history teaches us uh, different lessons. One of the lessons, uh, lessons is uh, that it is very difficult to make decent projections in the future. Another lesson uh, is uh, about uh, it states that uh, you never take an independence of a state for granted. And uh, there is a very popular uh, idea that Ukraine gained its independence peacefully and without any war and conflict. But uh, therefore, uh, it, Ukraine didn't have any intentions to produce and develop strong capacity to protect its independence. Uh, I can agree with this uh, proposition only partially, because uh, uh, if we didn't have uh, any war or any serious conflict prior to 2014, uh, it is already an achievement, an achievement of our foreign policy, of our diplomats, and uh, the uh, use of uh, the international uh, political environment. 
But apart from the existential considerations, foreign policy is also a reflection of a state's uh, will to develop and project its power to other states. Let us try to understand Ukraine's foreign policy through the evolution of its foreign policy discourse. Uh, I select the, uh, the, the evolution of the foreign policy discourse in uh, two periods, one uh, prior to 2014 and the second uh, after the very well known events of 2014. It is all conditional, but still we need some uh, uh, periodization. Well, the first period, to my mind, uh, the first period of Ukraine's independence is marked by romanticism. We believed uh, in the 1990s that uh, the environment of international politics is soft and easy. We believed that the market economy is all about good. We believed also that foreign investments are always for good. And one of the most famous symbols of this period of romanticism in Ukraine's uh, foreign policy is the so-called Budapest Memorandum of 1994. The Budapest Memorandum is a political document designed to arrange the decision to denuclearize Ukraine. The romantic part uh, in this famous story is that in the view of Ukrainian decision makers in 1994, having said yes to denuclearization, Ukraine expected eternal and unconditional love from its partners, the United States, the United Kingdom and uh, Russia. But what appears uh, from real life love stories Love is something that needs to be proved on a daily basis. I'm sorry for this simplistic example, but the comparison is very close. Uh, it is all about security. Um, the essence of any foreign policy is uh, uh, achievement of core national interest. Uh, it's uh, the national security of state. And to my mind, the biggest mistake of Ukrainian decision makers in 1990s was a belief that the Budapest Memorandum would be so-called certificate, certificate of collective marriage without an option of divorce. We know this story. We know the, how the Budapest Memorandum didn't prove itself. And uh, we, we have the certificate, but we do not have love from our partners. Uh, again, it's a real life comparison. Another example of uh, uh, such a romantic attitude to foreign policy is uh, preparation of the association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. The process itself started in 2008 mm -hmm. And in several years, the agreement was ready to sign and uh, to be implemented. But it appeared only in the second half of 2013 that the top level Ukrainian decision makers uh, hadn't been aware of what they were going to sign. Again, allow me a simplistic comparison here. Uh, when a person starts a love affair, he or she should be prepared to take responsibility for the consequences. And as we know the story, the consequences were not funny at all. Uh, the uh, uh, stop to this process of European integration produced uh, huge results, uh, a, a fantastic uh, response from the society. So I would like to propose the first conclusion of the evolution of the foreign policy discourse of Ukraine. Uh, it is that romanticism and declarative approach in foreign policy always leads to trouble. Ukraine, as a result, gained no serious guarantees of its security from its partners, as well as uh, Ukraine produced high expectations from its own people towards European integration and democratic reforms. 
In 2014, Ukraine faced a new reality where Russia is an enemy which can take a part of its territory and support uh, warfare on uh, the Ukrainian territory. What is, to my mind, is crucial for the new period of our foreign policy, the current period of our foreign policy, is a significant shrinkage of choices. Our foreign policy has become far more predictable. Is it for good? Arguably. Uh, apart from loss of territory, Ukraine lost also lots of possibilities for diplomatic maneuver. Sometimes our current foreign policy is characterized as pragmatic. I would say that this pragmatism, pragmatism is rather decorative. The missing part uh, to my mind is uh, national interest. Our current foreign policy is active sometimes even uh, proactive, but still it is full of questions. What do we expect from Russia? Do we expect it to disintegrate? Do we, are we waiting for uh, Putin to die? What do we expect from Russia? There is no exact answer from on this, to these questions in our foreign policy. Another question, do we really hope to join the NATO? Do we really believe that the NATO would take the risk of membership for Ukraine? Another question, how do we select the right and wrong partners? If we uh, select foreign policy partners on the criteria of uh, democratic or authoritarian rule, then we see also double standards in Ukrainian foreign policy. And uh, it all appears that uh, currently in our foreign policy, a good picture is uh, better than a solid result. So I would like uh, to propose the second conclusion to this uh, second current foreign policy uh, period that our modern pragmatism in foreign policy is rather selective. We still count on so-called moral obligations of our partners. And what is crucial and essential, and maybe even existential for our foreign policy now, is that we need a serious assessment of our national interest. I would like to sum up here, and uh, I would, it would be a pleasure for me to elaborate more in detail if uh, there would be questions from the uh, distinguished members of our webinar, and I thank you for your attention. Roman, thank you very much for a very bright presentation and especially bright comparison with uh, uh, marriages, love affairs, and really and uh, at the end of your talk, uh, rhetorical questions, uh, which are really very, very crucial for uh, each, uh, each person in Ukraine, yes, especially for our power, uh, for our authorities. And now we are opening uh, the floor of our webinar to, to discussion, to the questions. And I'm sure after these stimulating presentations, uh, our audience would like to, um, to make some comments and to um, Ask some questions, so please use the button below uh, uh, the button below Q and A uh, section. And uh, um, I propose, um, I suggest to start with um, our discussion with the questions that I prepared uh, during your presentations. Uh, so, Georgi, um, you were talking about the nationalization of the state of Ukraine and the promotion of Ukrainian uh, exclusive nationalism. How do you think, uh, um, uh, were there any other alternatives uh, to, to, to these options? And would be these alternati uh, alternatives uh, successful? And the second uh, question uh, is, uh, what could be the next steps in the nationalization of Ukraine? And is the denationalization of the country possible? Mikhail, uh, the next question to you is, uh, uh, could you tell me which historical period uh, can be considered to be the most uh, the most democratic one in the um, history of independent Ukraine? And can we uh, consider uh, today's Ukraine as a really democratic state? Um, 
And Ramon, the next question goes to you. Um, have you observed, lastly, a shift, any shift in the foreign policy of uh, Ukraine? Uh, what can follow the strengthening of the relations between Ukraine and the United Kingdom? Thank you. Uh, we can start uh, with uh, Georgi, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, it, it is not about alternatives to a nationalizing state. Uh, alternatives might, might come from outside the state. For instance, we have an alternative promoted by Russia, for instance. Yes, so, uh, and it is a kind of uh, uh, external irredentism. Russia, for instance, does not welcome uh, Russian ethnic nationalism within, within country, but Russia promotes Ukraine, uh, Russian ethnic nationalism irredentist nationalism outside the country in the form of Ruski Mir. But uh, so this is this might be uh, considered as an alternative. So Ukraine might become, uh, might be considered as a part of a bigger space and bigger culture and political space by Russia. But within Ukraine, there is no alternative to, uh, in terms of nationalizing states. A, a nationalizing state is a part of, uh, let's say, natural development of, uh, of any state since 19th century. So uh, the major problem with nationalizing state is not alternative. The major problem is when you do not have a balance between the inclusive civic nationalism and exclusive ethnic nationalism. So uh, the, we uh, should consider and our policymakers, I'm sure that our policymakers did not listen to us at this moment and would not listen to us later. But nevertheless, um, I'm trying to, I, I think that the idea of uh, inclusive as, as civic nationalism should be promoted, not just in the constitution, which is, uh, well, the constitution uh, has been violated by, by every uh, policymaker in our country, but uh, nevertheless, just to follow constitution, which promotes the principle of civic nationalism, and then to, uh, to develop a kind of, uh, understanding of, uh, uh, of the citizenry as a, in terms of, of civic nationalism. By the way, ordinary citizens do this. They call themselves Ukrainians by the fact of the citizenry, not citizenship, not by the fact of the ethnic origins. Of course, part of them do this in, the, in the terms of ethnic nationalism. But generally, even if you apply for, uh, well, apply it, in the recently applied for visa and then you asked about nationality it was a question not about your ethnic origin it was a question about your citizenship so people are being accustomed to the idea of a civic nationalism unfortunately our politicians and part of our ruling class use the uh, card of ethnic nationalism in their internal games and in their external policies and in their uh, uh, struggle between each other. So <laughs> paradoxically, the challenge and the threat comes from rulers, not from citizens. And this is the major challenge. And uh, I mean, internal challenge. And uh, if we would discuss the, uh, the future, uh, I, unfortunately, I'm a historian, I'm not a political scientist and not futurologist. So I cannot talk, I cannot speak about future. I'm not, I don't know what would happen in the next 10, 15 minutes, not in the next 10, 15 years. So uh, I would suggest that, I would suggest that the normality of Ukraine's development, further development is a not about alternatives between state and nation, nation state. It is the way to the building of the state nation with inclusive uh, civic nationalism and with the recognition of multiplicity and variety of cultural and political legacies within the country. Otherwise, any other options just lead to internal strife and conflicts. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Georgi. I just want to add that uh, maybe not uh, our uh, top uh, Ukrainian politicians uh, don't participate in this kind of uh, uh, events, but we have um, among us uh, in the audience uh, um, Svetlana Grabovska, who is a consulate, uh, um, who is a war, uh, consul in uh, Lublin uh, General Consulate. So it's, um, I think it's not, not too bad. <laughs> so I think, um, uh, can we go to the next uh, um, question, Mikhail? Thank you, Anna. Um, I have two questions. The, f the first one is the most democratic periods of uh, Ukraine, and it's basically early period of independence when the impulse of um, Perestroika Perbudova was very important, and this pluralism, and the lack of mechanisms uh, of oligarchy uh, created a very inspiring uh, momentum. And basically it leads, this period leads to the creation of Ukrainian constitution in 1996. But also in several months, the, the other processes become uh, very influential and democratization and democratic elements go down. The second uh, very vibrant democratic period is approximately 2005, 2008, before the, uh, before, after the Orange Revolution and before the economic um, crisis. And in this period, we, we see many problems on uh, inter-ethnic or intercultural, interlingual uh, issues, but definitely there was an attempt of a very fast uh, liberal democratization, which ends already due to internal cleavages and uh, fight between the pro-orange and anti-orange uh, teams. So that's uh, the answer. In other periods, the, we had stronger non-democratic traits uh, so far. And uh, if we talk about today's situation, can we consider Ukraine uh, as democracy, regretfully not. Uh, we have more and more uh, non-functioning institutions that defend democracy, especially liberal and participative uh, elements. Uh, liberal democracy is based on constitution, constitutional court, uh, and uh, division of powers. The, the power of the Security Council that now makes all the decisions instead of courts, instead of parliament, and instead of cabinet of ministers, shows that the division is forgotten and constitution cannot be practiced properly. So we are in a diffi difficult situation, which cannot be called in any possible way a democratic uh, liberal democracy. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, Raman? Uh. Yes, thank you. Uh, replying to the uh, answer uh, to the question that you have uh, offered, uh, as for the foreign policy orientation of Ukraine, uh, honestly, since 2014, I see no shifts in uh, the foreign policy orientation because. Um, starting from 2014, uh, Ukraine exactly affiliated itself with the, the Western countries and uh, chose the path of confrontation with uh, the, the country that started occupation of uh, its territory and uh, uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid war in uh, the east uh, of Ukraine. And uh, generally speaking, no shift in this uh, foreign policy orientation I, I can observe. As for the role of the United Kingdom in uh, our foreign policy and the recent uh, inten uh, intensification of the contacts, I relate this to the uh, vacuum of uh, attention to Ukraine from the United States uh, during the rule of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, the United Kingdom, mm, well, uh, is playing a kind of a role of a mentoring country from the Western um, uh, group of countries. And uh, 
uh, as we can observe it uh, on the exam on such example as uh, statements of the uh, ambassador of the G7 in Ukraine, uh, the British ambassador uh, replaced the American ambassador in uh, official statements and uh, the main communicator with the Ukrainian authorities. So um, to sum up, uh, the foreign policy orientations uh, stays the same during all this period and the United Kingdom uh, plays the mentoring role from the Western countries. Roman, thank you. And uh, as um, everyone knows that uh, this year Ukraine celebrates not only the 30th anniversary of its independence. Uh, this year Ukraine also celebrates the 25th anniversary of uh, its constitution, just in two weeks. And having in mind that um, the constitution ensures the European Union and not membership as a strategic um, foreign and security policy objective of Ukraine. I have a very broad question to, to all the participants, to all the speakers. In your opinion, how likely is that Ukraine within the next 30 years become a part of the European Union? And will it gain the NATO membership uh, during these 30 years? Now, please, uh, quick answers, just up to two, three minutes. Um, yes or no, and, and why? Maybe we'll start with Roman as a specialist in foreign relations. I think it will be logical. Thank you. Uh, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, it is uh, not so easy to make uh, predictions in the future. And uh, history tells us that uh, it is not a very good job to do that. Uh, but still, uh, expecting uh, some uh, affiliation and um, maybe even membership of Ukraine in the European Union is really is really hard. It's, it's difficult. It's problematic, and uh, uh, it is uh, really uh, I, I would say naive. Uh, uh, and even in uh, conjunction with the, your previous question, uh, with the uh, uh, related to uh, uh, relations between Ukraine and the United Kingdom. Uh, recently, uh, the British ambassador uh, gave an interview uh, where she mentioned that uh, the United Kingdom will assist Ukraine in its path to integrate to the European Union. And after the events of the Brexit, it is really rather problematic to uh, 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 to assume uh, how the uh, United Kingdom can assist us, maybe uh, share its experience with the with Ukraine and uh, how to enter and then exit. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, honestly speaking, uh, uh, real integration perspectives for Ukraine in the European Union are, is extremely difficult question to discuss because the level of uh, uh, democratization, real, I mean, uh, participatory uh, mechanism, uh, how, how it works, uh, how the uh, uh, citizens uh, feel they are linked to the state and uh, on to this decisions made in the state, uh, the economic structure, uh, all this is so different uh, to the European practice that it is, uh, really uh, unbelievable, even in 30 years. Thank you, Roman. Uh, Mikhail, what is your perspective? Well, I honestly believe that the only future uh, that exists is the one that we make. So if we really make the membership in NATO or in EU, our goals, it, it can be done. Although I would think in more important, the more important issues are social justice, uh, criminal justice, uh, better income for uh, Ukrainians, uh, very strong system defending civic, human and political rights to all Ukrainians. Th these are the aims. And I think if we gain them, then it's going to be very much easy to trade with EU or with NATO on these issues. So I would 
really think that this uh, membership issue is secondary. Right now, social and actually physical uh, security are number one, and then the rights issues number two that should be in the center of, of Ukraine's development. Thank you. I'm, I really very appreciate your answer and I totally agree with you. And uh, Georgi, I, I know that you are not a futurologist, uh, as you told already, but uh, maybe for a couple of seconds, when minutes, uh, you could uh, play this role. Uh, well, uh, it, it's quite anecdotal uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, well years and plans, etc. In 1998, I, I visited the headquarters of NATO in Mons. Uh, close to Brussels, and uh, I met two generals from NATO. And uh, when I told them that I am from Ukraine, they laughed and said, well, probably in 10 years. Uh, so exactly in 2008, there was Bucharest summit in, and uh, the, <laughs> Germany and France said decisively no to the uh, membership of Ukraine, to the prospects of membership of Ukraine in NATO. So first of all, when we ask about future membership, we should ask members of NATO, do they want Ukraine to be a member of NATO? That would be the question. Uh, as to me, I am quite skeptical about both NATO and European Union, about membership there, because first of all, NATO has real internal problems now. I just mentioned Turkey, which is a member of NATO, and which has no prospect to become a member of European Union. And the new developments in the last 10 years brought a lot of problems within, inside NATO. So we have conflicts within the NATO, between NATO members. As to the membership in European Union in the next 30 years, I would pray that European Union would uh, exist uh, within the next 30 years, because we have a number of, well, Brexit, I, I remember that recently we had talks about poll ex exit, exit, and then we have other exits. So European Union also in this, in the, in this state of crisis. And for instance, COVID-19 also showed real problems within this structure. It, well, it's likely to survive and likely to mobilize uh, on this kind of global challenge, but generally, uh, when I absolutely agree with Mikhailo that if we want to talk, just to talk, not to plan, just to talk about membership in some kind of external structures, we first have to do something within our country to, uh, well, to arrange everything here that we would feel ourselves confident. In this case now, in this real situation, I see very patrimonial expectations uh, from Ukrainian elites and from the citizenry that if we would become members of NATO, become neighbor, members of European Union, someone, some dobry dyadya from outside, some good uncle from outside would help us to become better. No, nobody would help us to become better. We should do, do, do this by ourselves, I understand that NATO is a measure, matter of security, but to be secure, first of all, you have to be secure inside your country and then start to talk about some kind of external protection, protect yourself and then ask for some kind of external forces to protect you. Thank you. Georgi, uh, for your optimistic and very realistic perspective, and now uh, I can, uh, I will have some questions from the audience. We have very uh, active audience today. Uh, the first question is to Roman Pitur from Karsten Santander Christensen. Uh, your statements are exactly my observations in Ukraine when I have visited the country after 2013. When uh, not Europe, do you think there will be an alternative for Ukraine, for instance, in Asia, in Asia? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would maybe uh, correct the question. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that uh, Ukraine uh, has nothing to do with Europe, uh, not at all. Um, and uh, as for the so-called Asian way or Asian alternative, uh, my PhD thesis was devoted to 
Ukraine's foreign policy in the Middle East. And uh, I, I can say that uh, we, we do have interests in Asia, in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, uh, and as well as we have interest in, uh, in Europe. And uh, mm -hmm. I would not exclude uh, all the uh, sides uh, of the world, all the parts of the world in, uh, uh, in the meaning that we can, um, we do need to cooperate with uh, all the regions. And uh, uh, we have specific interests in Europe and uh, in Asia and uh, our uh, parts of our industry and economy can be used to um, promote uh, certain geographic uh, directions of our foreign policy. So I would not exclude no geographic direction. They are, they should be, they, we must utilize all of them because we, uh, it, it is rather existential for us to abolish and to give up uh, some uh, interests in Asia, in Central Asia, and even in Russia, and uh, in the Middle East. If we forget that uh, parts of our industry or economy is related and it can be used to develop ourselves, and having in mind our general direction, the European integration, we can use all the uh, advantages of the world to work in this direction, to develop ourselves, to develop democracy, economy, uh, you know, law system, and all, all we need to develop and to be a civilized democratic nation ready to integrate to the European Union. Currently, we just declare, but we need to work in order to 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 be prepared for this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next two questions uh, uh, from the audience uh, goes to go to uh, uh, to Professor Minakov. Uh, the first is from um, Maxim Sorinsky. Uh, do you think uh, uh, do you think the oligarchization is a viable initiative of the president on the current period of Ukraine's development, or is it a simple smoke bomb to disperse public op opinion without any outcome to flow to follow? And uh, maybe afterwards I will read the next one. Uh, thank you, Pana Maxima. Uh, it's a very important question. I think that de-oligarchization de is an important policy direction, but the way it is done, it's done in a very doubtful uh, way so far. In um, details, I analyzed and published, I, I published in, uh, the, the analysis of the law that proposed by President Zelensky on Canon Focus Ukraine. It's a special blog at Canon Institute dedicated to Ukrainian uh, American dialogue of experts and scholars. Here, I would say that uh, right now it looks like the, the major initiative of the president is directed at oligarchs themselves. However, oligarchy is a system. It's a number of informal institutions that control different parts of the branches of power within clan structures. We take away these uh, figures, central figures, important figures, of course, and then these clans will reproduce new, new people. Ukraine is full of strong, brave uh, men, Cossacks and women, very uh, initiative uh, people. So uh, these gaps will be filled within months. So I, I wouldn't expect this personal sanctioning without proper court processes, without policies against uh, monopolies uh, th this uh, wouldn't work. But still, if it's only the first step that will be followed by other like demonopolization uh, process, making uh, economic development more even, that would uh, be a proper way of uh, doing things. Uh, great answer. And the next question uh, from uh, Carsten uh, Sander Christensen. Uh, how will you characterize the difference between the introduction of democracy in Poland and Ukraine? 
And is it uh, uh, maybe this is an answer there um, in this difference, in this different results? Dear Anna, I am ready to respond to this question, but I saw that Georgi wanted to add something to the first one. Is it possible to give? Of course, I didn't. I didn't see it. Of course, thank you. Georgi, uh, thank you. I just uh, yes, that uh, I just was inspired by what uh, Mikhail said uh, about the system. Uh, what Zelensky does not doing now is it just a well to me it's a kind of sample of populism, uh, but well it's kind of uh, continuation of Sluga Naroda. Uh, for uh, so, but uh, uh, if you look at Ukraine from this kind of patrimonial and patriarchal uh, ties at every level, you will see that all you can find oligarchs not just in Kiev or Dnipro, you can find oligarchs in every oblast center, in every rayon center. It's a part of now, it's a part of culture. Uh, throughout all Ukraine, we have, I myself live in the countryside and uh, I have a center in Rayon city and I see local oligarchs, uh, local, this so-called Meza elites, uh, which just reproduce uh, what is going on on the central level. Absolutely. So uh, just to, to bring another law uh, in the country when there is no rule of law exist, that uh, it's just a populist move. So uh, they, there is a need of continuous, prolonged systemic effort at all levels, not just at the level of president who will introduce kind of, <laughs> kind of measures also executed by special body, which does not have constitutional power to do this, in fact. So, <laughs> so that, that, that might just uh, pass, passing remarks on, on, on this question. Thank you very much for opportunity to express myself here. Thank you. Great remarks. Um, so there were, uh, the floor is yours, Mikhail. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Christensen. Um, you're right. If we look at the prehistory, well, the early historical periods of 90s, how the introduction of democracy in Poland and in Ukraine uh, were done, they would probably explain next 10 or 15 years. Still, uh, in Poland, we can see that, uh, as Anders Aslund calls it, early Poland is the case of early uh, reformers in economy and in, uh, in politics. So when we have very fast uh, reforms in both sectors, politics and economy, they were kind of supporting each other in terms of democratization, marketization, and uh, growth of economy. And uh, up until, let's say, 2015, this model would look very serious. But now that Poland has made its own illiberal turn and the, the role of uh, oligarchic principles, informal group principle, conservative uh, creativity, ideological creativity, it also shows that even in, in the case of uh, leader of uh, Central and Eastern European democratization, we are not safe from drawbacks, from re-autocratization. Uh, uh, re of course, uh, Poland remains democracy, but it's not liberal anymore. And th this change undermines also Ukrainian uh, initiatives in democratization, because we oriented at Polish example, at Visegrad four examples, as landmarks, we could borrow your experience for us. But now it's a question is, is uh, the, the democratic experience of Poland as applicable to us or as it recommendable to be applied? Uh, yes, thank you. We usually hear this uh, comparison that uh, why Poland succeeded say, in reforms and unfortunately Ukraine did not. Uh, and my next question may be for all of you, uh, maybe a little bit provocative, um, especially um, in the year of Ukrainian independence, the 30th um, anniversary of Ukrainian independence. What is your opinion about the next 30 years? Will Ukraine survive as independent state uh, within its current borders? Um, if yes, under what conditions? And uh, if not, 
under what conditions? Maybe we can start with uh, Professor Kasyanov. Anya, what do, you, what do you mean by the current borders? Um, it's a rhetoric uh, question. Uh, uh, the current border as, as you see, as you see them. Uh, you mean the uh, borders which marked on the uniform of the football team uh, uh, with Crimea and uh, so. Uh, it's an open question. Uh, so open. Legally, our borders now already broken. Uh, so uh, in 2014. So when we talk about current borders, it is uh, well, it, it, it's really provocative question. Okay, the fact of the Euro borders. So the borders which are uh, defined by international law, uh, Ukraine already does not exist in these borders. So uh, part of this, uh, our territories are taken by uh, by the uh, by our neighbor, and. Uh, the second uh, part of this question is that uh, <laughs> we have another neighbors uh, in the West who also make some claims sometimes uh, not to broke, not to break uh, physical borders, but to break some cultural or whatever borders. And this claim sometimes provoked by our internal policies, sometimes uh, provoked by internal policies of our neighbors, for instance, in Hungary. So, uh, and this is a real challenge to us. And uh, you ask again about 30 years. Uh, well, uh, I would say that I don't care about 30 years, uh, taking into account my own age. But uh, generally, uh, uh, it is too long, too, too far to predict anything. I would say that uh, in terms of uh, current situation, uh, Ukraine is strong enough to keep itself as a political entity. So, and once again, going back to uh, what uh, was the question which was raised by Mikhail and you, the major uh, precondition for uh, development of Ukraine is internal reform, the uh, changes within the country, within the citizenship, etc. So, uh, otherwise, we might have a borders but we might not have a population. The population would come somewhere else, no, would not live in Ukraine. So uh, generally, uh, I have a uh, well, well-grounded, optimistic approach to the existence of Ukraine. If you existed for 30 years, why should you exist for the next 30 years? So, uh, but uh, we have a lot of challenges. And once again, I would say that the major challenges are inside the country. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, Professor Minakov, what is uh, your opinion? Well, again, I will return to my thesis about future. The, the only future that there is, it's the one that we make. And uh, in order to return to the um, borders that we had, well, th these are the internationally recognized uh, borders of Ukraine anyway. So in order to return to the, uh, our borders, we have to look at ourselves and to the future, to, to this idea as a possible indicator, not a, part, not a membership in some uh, alliance, although partnership or alliances are important tools. So it's not the goal. The goal is to return to these borders, to reinstate our uh, sovereignty in all possible ways, which means that we have to recognize that today we are a divided people, like the Germans were, like today the Chinese are. And uh, we have to promote and go on with our nation building or state building with idea that we have to return to these borders, also in the next generation, so in the next 30 years, which means that we have to review and uh, stop the implementation of current cultural policies, uh, return to inclusivity, not only lingual or cultural or ethnic. We have to return to social inclusivity. We, we are talking about country that is very much divided in, uh, by income, by, by rights. If you live in a rural area or if you live in a small town, your uh, future is much more limited than if you live in Kyiv. This injustice 
it also shows the level of, uh, of division. So inclusivity in all possible meanings and the idea of sovereignty of balance of a human rights, uh, human uh, sovereignty or citizen sovereignty, sovereignty of majority, we have to recognize it as well, and sovereignty of government. So in the balance of these sovereignties, we may actually create the state that would easily become a EU member, that would easily develop and would become a country comfortable for its own citizens and welcoming for all the people outside. So we have um, a huge whole work to be done in the next uh, 30 years. Um, Roman, uh, what is your perspective? Uh, thank you, Anna. Your question is uh, really very hot uh, because uh, uh, territory is something that uh, is gained with uh, 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 huge efforts and uh, we cannot just uh, give up and uh, trade our territory. Uh, we, uh, we must value this, uh, this capital uh, in the territory. Uh, and it is a very great risk uh, in our foreign, uh, in our uh, modern public discourse, uh, a risk of devaluation of territory. Sometimes we can hear that we do not need those territories where people live with different views. It's a great risk, great challenge to foreign uh, Ukraine, uh, to, to, to modern Ukraine. Because, as uh, Professor Cassiano mentioned, there is another risk of uh, depopulization, uh, uh, shrinkage, uh, and the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, when we uh, when we lose uh, population, uh, it is another risk because uh, when we get, we have uh, areas. Uh, empty from population, uh, we have intentions from our uh, neighbors to, to get access to this territory. And the, uh, all these uh, um, issues in our public social discourse could be re-evaluated and we uh, should not um, allow the de de devaluation of this, uh, uh, of this uh, values, uh, I mean, territory and population. Uh, all these uh, 30 years, yes, we, we existed. And uh, as uh, Professor Cassiano mentioned, if we existed for 30 years, why not we uh, exist another 30 years? But uh, I would mention that we exploited some getting from the scratch. And, and uh, if uh, the current politics and ideology save its territory and population for, for the next 30, we need urgently change something in our domestic politics in our uh, uh, in trying to find uh, a social uh, justice uh, social peace and uh, uh, these issues should be reflected in our foreign policy because we need to gain uh, to gain friends around us uh, we are now in a, a rather uh, a grave situation when we have uh, uh, acute enemy to the east and we have uh, latent uh, enemies around us also because uh, territorial disputes and territorial issues uh, uh, remain and we need to, to do something with this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roman. Uh, maybe uh, there were some some problems with connection, but I hope uh, uh, the audience and other speakers um, heard everything well. 
and I hope uh, Roman, uh, uh, are you with us? Okay. Yes, uh, I'm here. I, okay, fantastic. I, I, I didn't notice any problems, so I'm sorry. But um, yeah, there were um, a few. And we have the next question to, 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 to Roman. What is uh, also from Car uh, Karsten Sander Christensen? What is your opinion, uh, the behavior uh, of the USA in the, uh, in the Russian uh, bad behavior on the Ukrainian territory? Have they helped uh, or have they made or less ignored reality? In fact, it's hard to understand. Do you, uh, can, did you catch uh, the idea? Well, uh, I will try to answer, and uh, if uh, if I understand the question correctly, the role of the USA in the in the process of uh, Ukraine-Russian uh, relation uh, what, was it for good or for bad? Uh, we we cannot deny that the United States are a close ally to Ukraine. Uh, the United States. Uh, for years have been supporting uh, democratic reforms in Ukraine and uh, uh, and now is one of the crucial partners uh, uh, to, to in, in our capacity to uh, sustain in uh, the uh, conflict with uh, Russia but still uh, I will I will try to, to be diplomatic enough uh, uh, Ukraine uh, needs to be um, uh, aware of its own in, uh, national interests, and we need to uh, finish our period of uh, declarations and romanticism and uh, evaluate uh, accurately the foreign policy calculations of other states. Uh, we cannot deny that the United States uh, have their own, own national interests in uh, the current situation and we must find the points of interest and, uh, and not to uh, not to uh, develop a situation of acute dependence on the foreign policy of the united states i think that uh, it is for the uh, in the core interest of the united states in itself to partner in the Eastern Europe, and Ukraine has a capacity to become this partner. But again, and I will, I would uh, repeat my uh, main uh, thesis of my presentation: we need a real reassessment of our national interests and uh, how they are uh, um, reflected in our foreign policy, and also in the relations with. Uh, uh, thank you. Maybe we'll um, uh, go to the end of our webinar, the last questions, and uh, I have a question to, to Roman, but maybe uh, someone else uh, wants to reflect on it. Uh, I, you're welcome. Um, I uh, um, want to speak about the Lublin Triangle, this initiative uh, this was, that was um, um, initiated last year uh, in um, by Ukraine, Poland, and Lithuania. This platform of political, economical, social, and uh, cultural cooperation between these three countries. Uh, some experts are quite optimistic about this um, initiative. Others are quite pessimistic. Pessimistic. Will in um, in your p in your opinion, Lublin Triangle bring uh, Ukraine closer to the U European Union and will it contribute to the European integration of Ukraine in the future? Roman? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, it would be great if uh, the the Dublin Triangle would be designed uh, as, a, as an example of a Visegrad group, uh, as a test platform to get uh, the partners prepared for the European integration. And uh, I mean, of course, uh, Ukraine. Uh, but uh, there are serious uh, uh, considerations. Uh, that the Lublin Triangle is a response uh, to mobilize support for Ukraine in its uh, 
uh, in its confrontation with uh, with Russia. If uh, if we uh, do not observe any institutional developments uh, in the framework of the Lublin Triangle, then the second proposition would be the, uh, the most correct. And uh, in this regard, um, hardly Lublin Triangle would be uh, 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 someone, uh, a preparation for the integration and democratic reform. So uh, currently I, um, I think that it is more for uh, as a platform for declarations for um, uh, mobilizing uh, ideological uh, um, uh, some kind of a discourse uh, to confront uh, the developments uh, in uh, in Russia and uh, Belarus. To my mind, I, I hope that uh, some institutionalization will take place in the framework of the triangle, and it would help. Uh, Ukraine, in addition to the Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative, um, uh, get prepared for the European integration. Thank you. Thank you, um, Hel. Uh, Georgi, would you like to, to add something or we can uh, finish our discussion with the last uh, question, but not a, provoc a, provoc a provocative one? Well, let's uh, hear the question then. Okay, so the, the last question in spite, is inspired by uh, Mikhail's um, presentation. Uh, you, in your presentation, uh, talked at the end variant about the challenges that Ukraine faces. I would like uh, to ask all of you, what are the main challenges and opportunities uh, that Ukraine faces today, uh, taking into account your field of professional interest, but not speaking about the whole, uh, the whole range of uh, these challenges and opportunities, but just like a field of your uh, expertise and uh, your thoughts on this. Maybe it was, it we'll start with Mikhail this time. Thank you, Anna. Uh, well, the, the, the threat is connected with the correlation between Ukraine's independence and democratization. So if Ukraine, Ukrainian independence was part of this global process, now we have the global process of autocratization. We, in political science, we now see this decline of democracies and spread of electoral uh, and a little bit of fully fledged autocracies. That means if the correlation is true, so this hypothetical uh, correlation is important here, then uh, we have more and more risks, global regional risks for independence. That's the challenge. The opportunity is to return to the path of inclusivity, to return to democratization attempt based on liberal principles and social principles, something that we lost totally. And then altogether try to reinvent ourselves as vibrant and successful country, not as a victim historical or of current situation, but a uh, people that overcome the dividedness like Germans did and reached the level comparable to Germany in democracy, legality, rule of law and uh, economic success. Thank you. Uh, Georgi? Uh, all I can do is just to endorse what uh, Misha said and uh, <clears throat> if, I will, if I would start just to list challenges, uh, it will take uh, another couple of hours. So, uh, well, what Misha said is uh, absolutely correct. I would add just one uh, spoon of salt to this. Is a just uh, one of the uh, one of the main challenges. One of the many challenges is the trust of citizens to the state, uh, according to the. Sociological polls from 1994 to 2020, and this uh, level of trust of citizens to state institutions in Ukraine is extremely low. And the lowest one, 9% of trust in 2019, uh, just uh, mentioned by Gallup. Uh, so they're probably one of the most prospective things to uh, make new Ukraine and make Ukraine great again is to recover trust of citizens to the state. 
And well, I will uh, limit myself just uh, with this. Thank you. It's quite enough, quite enough uh, answer. And uh, Raman, your, your point of view? Uh, well, again, I totally agree with the previous speakers. And uh, as for the so-called added value, I would just uh, add a um, notion that is quite far from foreign policy um, topic, but uh, to my mind is crucial for democracy and uh, independence and, uh, and also what uh, Professor Kasyanov mentioned, the trust of people to the state in the um, protection of property rights uh, in uh, the modern uh, um, uh, society, which is uh, development, developing uh, market economy, because uh, uh, we cannot uh, develop any uh, discussion on uh, uh, economic development, uh, foreign investments, uh, and uh, uh, in, and even the issue of uh, the oligarchization, if we uh, forget uh, the issue of uh, property rights and the uh, uh, uh attitude to this problem from the state uh, um, on a on a decent level when uh, uh, when uh, in order to create conditions when uh, ordinary people and uh, rich people do not uh, look for safe havens and uh, instead they invest in their own country and develop their own economy uh, so this is uh, the only point I would like to add that uh, uh, development of a uh, true market economy is uh, crucial also for the foreign, uh, for the modern, uh, modern uh, society and uh, an in independent country which Ukraine is uh, striving to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I would like uh, to say thank you for your very, in fact, really optimistic, uh, uh, inspiring and, of course, very diplomatic answers for not uh, um, uh, for um, too difficult questions. Uh, because of the time limitations, it is impossible, of course, for us to cover all the facets uh, of the today's topic. Nevertheless, I think uh, this session helped us uh, to analyze more deeply the Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians' achievements um, as an independent state and to identify the challenges and opportunities uh, that, our, uh, that Ukraine faces today. Uh, to conclude, uh, uh, I would like, on behalf of the director of the Institute of Central Europe, Professor Beata Surmach, to thank the speakers for their valuable presentation and a very, very interesting discussion and for, share, for sharing your knowledge. And I also would like to thank our participants uh, uh, for attending uh, this webinar, for the uh, very inspiring questions, and a special thank you to Consul Svetlana Hrabovska from the General Consulate of Ukraine in Lublin. A special word of thank you uh, also to my colleagues from the Institute of Central Europe for their support in making this event possible. A recorded version of this webinar will appear soon uh, maybe uh, already tomorrow uh, in internet. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the day.